Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar from UCLA that will provide an update on acute stroke treatments and the outcome of the FAST TSC trial. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Saver, a professor of neurology here at UCLA and at the Ronald Reagan Medical Center, UCLA Comprehensive Stroke Center. Let's begin by talking about how common and devastating stroke can be. It is the leading cause of serious disability in the United States and the fifth leading cause of death in the US. It's the second leading cause of death worldwide. Every year in the US, nearly 800,000 people have a stroke and 140,000 of them pass away from the stroke. Because it's a disease that often leaves people alive but injured, there are currently 5 million stroke survivors in the US and in their lifetime, one in six people will have a stroke, a very common and uh, potentially devastating disease. Well, what is a stroke? It's injury to the brain from blockage or rupture of a blood vessel. And there are two types of stroke. Uh, one is the blockage stroke, ischemic stroke, where a uh, clot lands in an artery and uh, cuts off the blood flow to that region. The nerve cells there don't get oxygen or nutrients and begin to die. The other type is a bleeding stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, where the blood vessel ruptures and blood escapes into or around the brain. The ischemic stroke is the most common type. Four out of five strokes are the blockage type of stroke and one out of five, the bleeding type of stroke. Another uh, related condition to know about is transient ischemic attacks or TIAs. And these are temporary symptoms due to a blockage, but the blockage resolves before damage permanently occurs. So symptoms last for a few minutes, up to a couple of hours, uh, and, but there's no injury to the brain because the clot spontaneously dissolved. Now, the importance of a transient ischemic attack is that it's a warning event. Whatever caused that blockage initially transiently could next time cause a longer lasting blockage and a big stroke. People who've had a TIA have 10 times the risk of having another stroke. One third of them will have a stroke in the next five years. So if you have this type of event, it's important to tell your doctor so that we can evaluate why the blockage occurred and put you on medications to keep the recurrence from happening. Well, what are the warning signs of a stroke? We use the public health message, the FAST mnemonic, F-A-S-T, to make people aware of the cardinal, the most common signs of a stroke to watch out for. Face stands for drooping of one side of the face. Arm stands for weakness on one side of the body. Speech stands for uh, language difficulty, speech difficulty, FAS. And if you have any of those, it is T, time to call 911. What puts people at increased risk for stroke? There are some things we can't do anything about. Being older, females have more than male, Certain race ethnic groups are at increased risk and heredity. If you have a first degree relative who've had a stroke, you have a one and a half fold increased risk of stroke. But there are many things that we can uh, treat to prevent stroke. Medical conditions, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. If you have the abnormal heart rhythm of atrial fibrillation, if you have diabetes, if you have narrowing of a carotid artery, all of those are very treatable conditions that can uh, reduce the risk of stroke. And then there are lifestyle behaviors that individuals can follow to reduce their risk of stroke. Don't smoke. Cigarette smoking increases the risk. Don't drink alcohol to excess, which is more than two drinks a day for a man and one drink a day for a woman. And don't be sedentary, physically inactive. That increases the risk of stroke. Who are the communities that are increased risk for stroke? Well, as I mentioned, older individuals, two thirds of all strokes happen in people over the age of 65, but one third happen under 65, including in midlife, in young adults, and in children. Pediatric stroke is very common. African Americans and Hispanics have higher stroke 
rates than whites. They are increased risk, and individuals who've had a first stroke have a tenfold increased risk of another stroke. Also here in Los Angeles County, we have a higher rate of stroke than in the surrounding region due to the particular socioeconomic and health conditions here in Los Angeles. The good news is stroke is highly preventable. In fact, 90% of all strokes can be prevented by the controlling 10 common treatable risk factors. And I've listed the most important ones here. How do you prevent a stroke? First, aerobic exercise, 20 to 60 minutes a day, walking, jogging, any large muscle activity. Eat a diet low in saturated fats, rich in fruit and vegetables. Don't smoke. Don't drink alcohol to excess. Control your blood pressure and cholesterol. If you have diabetes, make sure that's well controlled. And if you have the abnormal heart rhythm of atrial fibrillation, then take anti-clotting medicines to keep that from causing a stroke. And with that, as I said, 90% of all strokes can be prevented. However, not everyone does that, and even people who do it, a small number will have stroke, and so uh, acute strokes do happen frequently. And so the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you what our treatments currently are for acute stroke uh, and, and why you should know the warning signs and come in right away. The challenge is we have a very brief time window in which to save brain during an acute stroke. Every minute that goes by with a large artery blocked, the brain loses 2 million nerve cells. It loses 14 billion synapses, the connections between nerve cells, and it loses seven and a half miles of the long fibers linking parts of the brain. So the public health message from the American Heart American Stroke Association is, Time lost is brain lost in acute stroke. Call 911 right away. What happens when you come to the hospital? Well, everyone gets supportive treatment. Oxygen, if it's low, we keep the body temperature normal and avoid high blood sugars. We give intravenous fluids to push more blood up around the blockage. We give treatments to keep clots from forming in the legs. And we do frequent neurologic and cardiac checks during that first 24-hour period of instability. But the two specific therapies we have available are shown here. And they both work to reopen that blocked artery, restore blood flow to the threatened nerve cells, and save them before they're irreversibly injured. The first is a uh, drug, tissue plasminogen activator, that dissolves the blood clots. We give this through an injection in the arm vein, and TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, goes through the body, and some of it reaches the clot in the brain and works to dissolve it. The other treatment is devices that we put in to pull the clot out of the blocked artery, stent retrievers, and aspirators. And the interventionalist doctors will put the device in the leg artery, advance it up into the brain and the brain blocked artery, and deploy it there. And uh, here you can see a blockage in this artery. And here is a stent, a little metal catch device deployed in it. And now, after pulling back, the artery is open because the clot has been pulled out of the body and is in our hands. And uh, these are uh, both effective therapies. Uh, TPA uh, uh, helps about uh, one in three to four patients, and the device therapies help even more. Um, and together, they are a powerful set of treatments for acute stroke. However, Currently in the U.S., only 10% of stroke patients are receiving this therapy. And an important reason is patients are not coming in soon enough. That's why it's important to come in quickly. Because uh, these therapies are not reaching everybody and they don't work perfectly, we continue to try to advance and develop new therapies. And I uh, want to tell you about a study we just completed uh, uh, looking at a new type of agent. This was a drug that's in the class of neuroprotective agents. 
uh, unlike treatments to reopen blocked arteries, neuroprotective agents affect nerve cell metabolism in a way to allow the nerve cells to tolerate low blood flow longer and survive until we can salvage them. And uh, we did the here in Los Angeles and Virginia, the FAST TSC trial, pre-hospital acute stroke treatment with transodium quercetinate, TSC. TSC is a molecule in the carotenoid family. That's what makes carrots orange. It increases oxygen entry into cells. And it was shown in animal studies to protect brain cells from sudden reduced blood flow and showed safety in initial studies in humans for other conditions. So we launched this trial to find out if TSC injected in the vein by paramedics in the field, in the ambulance, in the first two hours after a stroke, improves the outcome of stroke patients. And the plan was to enroll 160 patients, all within two hours of onset. Half of them would get the active TSC, and half would get inactive placebo salt water. This would be done at 23 hospitals, including 20 here in Los Angeles County and three in Central Virginia. And the study was funded by Diffusion Pharmaceuticals of Charlottesville. Now we used a very specific enrollment process in FAST TSC because this is an emergency treatment trial and we, don't ha we have to get the drug started right away and patients often are not able to communicate with us uh, uh, about the study. And so uh, for patients who were able to communicate with us and we were able to communicate with them by telemedicine to the ambulance, we would go over the trial with them have them read a written and informed consent, sign it, and be enrolled. But many patients, they're unable to participate in a consent decision because the stroke has affected the language part of the brain, it's affected the perceptual part of the brain, or it's affected the decision-making part of the brain. And for those patients, the FDA and the Human Subjects Protection Committees have said uh, we can enroll those patients if you've done community consultation and public disclosure and enroll them uh, so they get the treatment and then consent them as soon as they recover the ability to consent. And so we did that. We met with uh, representatives of uh, the uh, people in Los Angeles at increased risk for stroke, uh, uh, older individuals, uh, African American uh, and Hispanic organizations, and the uh, uh, survivors of prior stroke. And we also uh, publicly let everyone know we were going to be doing this study and enrolling patients with this brief verbal discussion with the patient to the extent they could understand that and, and make sure that they would be okay with being in the study. And we opened for enrollment in January of 2020. And during the first few weeks, we uh, opened one of the ambulance systems in Los Angeles and three of the receiving hospitals in Los Angeles. And during the first uh, few uh, weeks, we enrolled six patients, four here in Los Angeles and two in Virginia. And then a month later, COVID hit. And we had to uh, shut down enrollment in the study because of the public health emergency. The ambulance system, EMS agency, needed to have all their resources available for transporting COVID patients, and the hospitals needed to have all their resources available for treating COVID patients. And of course, we completely understood that, and so enrollment in the study was su suspended until COVID would be over um, and we could enroll. We, we kept enrolling at the sites we were open at, but we s did not open up any additional hospitals. And uh, so in February 2020, we um, had to suspend uh, the opening of additional sites. And then by August of 2020, uh, we still were not able to start enrolling in any volume, and it became clear we were not going to be able to finish this study in a reasonable time frame because of COVID, that it was going to uh, be a long time before we could resume full enrollment. So unfortunately, we therefore had to terminate the study, stop the study at that time point. Um, we had enrolled six patients, and 
here are their outcomes. One had a full recovery at three months, one was mildly disabled, three moderately disabled, and one had died. Kind of the typical range of outcomes for stroke. With so few patients, it's hard to tell if the drug had made a difference um, in these patients or not. Um, we plan to go back and resume this and related studies in stroke patients with this promising agent once the COVID emergency is over. Now, although uh, FAST TSC did not yet give us a successful agent, there have been some recent developments in acute stroke treatment that are very exciting and I'd like to briefly tell you about. One is the development of mobile stroke units. These are ambulances that have a CT scanner in the ambulance. They also have a neurologist in person or by video, a nurse, a CT tech, and in the ambulance right there on the street, we can get a CAT scan, and if there's no bleeding in the brain, we can give the clot dissolving medicine right away. If there is blood in the brain, we don't want to give the clot dissolving medicine, um, and uh, so we can make that necessary imaging to make the initial treatment decision. We can see which arteries are blocked and decide if the patient needs to go to a hospital where they can do the clot retrieval therapies. Um, the mobile stroke unit here in LA was the first in the western third of the United States. It has been running for two years and it has been very successful at giving these proven stroke therapies in an earlier time frame than ever before. And since every minute matters, that is leading to better patient outcomes. Another exciting development is uh, the ability to treat select patients in later time windows. Uh, it turns out that when a blockage happens in a brain artery, uh, in a fair number of patients, as we discussed, the stroke progresses very quickly, and within the first few hours, it's done. By six hours, there's no more brain left to save. But in about half of patients, the stroke progresses more slowly. Some damage does usually occur, but there's still significant salvageable tissue uh, between six to 24 hours after onset. So in those patients, we would have liked to get to them at one hour, but if they didn't arrive to hour eight or 12, uh, half of them still have salvageable tissue. The way we find that out is by doing imaging. And we use MRI or CT scans to uh, image how much of the brain is permanently injured already, how much has low blood flow but is not yet injured, and where the blockage is. And uh, the areas with low blood flow that are not yet permanently injured are the target of therapy, the salvageable tissue. And we can do this with MRI or with CT scan in five minutes of table time and be able to tell for each individual patient whether they have salvageable brain and choose the best way to treat them. So it's still best to come in early. Uh, uh, treating in hour one is better than hour two, um, even though we can sometimes treat beyond uh, six hours. So let me close by reminding, and now that you're experts, expanding your knowledge of stroke warning signs. The expanded signs to know of is the BFAST mnemonic, B-E-F-A-S-T. The two new ones, B stands for loss of balance, and I stands for loss of vision or double vision. And those are a little less common stroke symptoms, but they are stroke symptoms, so also helpful to be aware of them. And then we have our old friends, FAS, face weakness, arm weakness, speech difficulty. If any of the BFAS symptoms happen, it's time to call 911 and get to the hospital right away because we do have these very effective therapies for acute stroke, but it begins with you by calling 911 so we can help out. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar.